they say, for example, we don't represent our prophet in figure, or indeed almost the human figure itself in figure, <clears throat> because we fear idolatry. That's good. It's much better than having pictures of weeping virgins or statues of them that may be led to weep if you can put enough pig's blood on it and put a candle nearby, the endless fraudulence of Christianity. Fine. That's their belief. But they can't tell me I can't talk about Prophet Man. They absolutely cannot do that. There wasn't a single newspaper in Britain that published those cartoons. There wasn't a single one, there was one magazine in America either. I know the people in, the, in charge of these matters in many cases. I went on CNN to debate some spokesman for a Muslim organization. and CNN put up the cartoons, the page of Denmark, pixelated. And I said to the interviewer, you're not doing this because you're afraid of upsetting my Muslim fellow guest, are you? You're doing it because you're afraid that you'll be burned out if you do. Your bureaus, she said, yes, that's right. Is that not a legitimate fear? It's a very legitimate fear. If you allow the right of Muslims to use violence against anything they don't like, of course it's a legitimate fear. It's certainly, it's not legitimate, it's a real one. But it seems to me amazing that my profession should give up without a fight on this point. So you should be happy and they're all doing it. National, uh, no, sorry, PBS, the, the public station, uh, decided they could do it this way. And it's significant. They said, we can show the cartoons in this manner. We can show them the imams of Denmark traveling around, showing the cartoons to others. We can film them doing that. And by accident, the cartoons are in the picture. Now, what does that mean? These imams have the right to show this blasphemy to anyone and did, and they added three cartoons of their own, one of which showed the prophet as a pig, which, as you know, is an assignment in itself. The words in the paper, they can do it, and we can't even see what they're talking about. Do right. you understand the significance of this? this is, the, the media is much too dominated for my taste by images. Everything is image now. Mm. Most, even the New York Times is mainly pictures. Here, the whole story is about an image, and no one is allowed to make up their minds by seeing it themselves. We're shielded it from shielded from it by our editors in a free press and a free country who are paralyzed with fear and paralyzed with the idea that anyone might be hurt. All right, this say, is disgraceful. Let's take on a case. Oh, do right. so. I'm sure well, as, as we know with the cartoons, only Muslims are allowed to represent Prophet Muhammad as a pig. Come on, this is not serious. I'm not going to live under the dictatorship of people like this. I'm not going to listen to their opinions. I'm not going to respect them. I'm going to say, no, you keep it yourself. Do not dare address me. Do not dare talk to me as if you're warning me when I comment on this. I won't have it. I won't be talked to in that tone of voice. My, my hero, Thomas Paine, was very much attacked and criticized by the vile uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, one of the most ranked Tories there's ever been. But I have to say I have a soft spot for the old buzzard all the same, but if, if only for his lexicography. And when he produced his first dictionary, he was visited by a group of old ladies, respectable women's association who called upon him in Fleet Street and said, Dr. Johnson, we'd like to congratulate you on your refusal to put any indecent words in your dictionary. <laughs> and he said, ladies, I'm very uh, obliged to you for revealing to me that you've been looking for them. <laughs> uh, that simple story is actually all you need about the censorship mentality. Those who want to be offended will always find something. There's no way of forestalling that. Uh, and just as uh, one cannot and tolerate being censored oneself, one can say with absolute confidence that if one was in favor of censorship, in principle, platonically, say, we wish it could be done, decency could be protected, obscenity could be avoided, offense could be, who's going to get the job? Do you know anyone? There will never be a human being born who's good enough for that job. No man is good enough to be another man's master in that way. There cannot be, there cannot be a censor or censorship that does not degenerate into absurdity and corruption, and there never has been and there never will be in all the excuses for it that there could be, that it protects superstition and religious fanaticism would be the worst. Very much good after the release. The Magister uh, last week found the energy to arrest and charge someone who stood outside the Catholic Evidence Guild office there holding up a copy of my book on Mother Teresa. They were very swift to punish him. You can't do that. You, who knows what will happen if we let you do it. But those who actually use and threaten violence are let off, let go. Get used to it, or don't get used to it. Get used to it and you'll live under it. The Resist it now while it can still be opposed. The, the this is a police state coming that says that the, we are there to protect 
religion and all religions. That, and it'll all be done in the name of niceness. It'll all be benign. Can you bear it? <laughs> Joseph Priestley, the man who discovered oxygen, had his laboratory in Birmingham. And uh, while he was doing his great scientific experiments, he also announced that he didn't believe in divine revelation <coughs> at all. He didn't believe in the monarchy, but he was effectively Unitarian. And as you know, the Unitarian belief is that there's one God maximum, and one God at most, if that. And um, a mob formed. It was called the Church and King Mob. It did a lot of work in those days you know, for the Hanoverian usurpers and their friends. And they smashed up his laboratory. They destroyed the only real scientific laboratory in Britain. They were so appalled that there was this scientist going on and making these profane remarks. He had to move to Philadelphia. Well, good for them. They got what they wanted. And Philadelphia got it. And Philadelphia got Joseph Priestley. Yeah. The, um, good the, for them. Christopher they had every right to have their feelings hurt by something they didn't understand, hadn't read, didn't care about, and knew that they wouldn't be punished by the authorities for an acts of vandalism and cruelty and intimidation. We want this back now. I thought we'd got over this. Now I have to face it all again. Arguments I've forgotten having to have, I'm having to have again, with religious fascists. I'm, 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 I'm ready to do it till the, I draw my last breath, but I'm appalled that anyone making excuses for them. These people have no concept of truth, no concept of honesty at all. They tolerate the idea of tolerance and plural to them. Ask them, you want to do this in Birmingham or in London um, or Manchester, or wherever it might be, Walsall. Uh, when can we hope for a synagogue to be opened in Saudi Arabia? When can we hope for a Christian church to be opened in Saudi Arabia? Or even a Shia one, as a matter of fact, which they consider to be a vicious heresy. When are you going to condemn the blowing up of mosques in Iraq? I, I'm an atheist. I wouldn't put a bomb in, a, in the Samara Dome. I, I have a natural human resistance to profanity. It comes from Antigone. It comes from Sophocles. It doesn't come from monotheism. They applaud these acts of atrocity and blasphemy. They, they have no concept of a reciprocal relationship on this. They, 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 they say, you concede to us, and we will concede nothing to you, and you should be proud to have us in your midst. Insufferable. Insufferable. What about the most important minority in the history of the world? Those who have never believed in God, those who believe that an ethical life is possible without religion, those who have studied this stuff and know that Judaism is a derived from ancient race myths and that Christianity is a plagiarism of that and Islam an e even worse plagiarism of the, of the two above, who don't want it. There are, there are lots of us. Uh, actually, the largest branch of the humanist movement in the world is probably in India which has a wonderful secular tradition. We have to be insulted and outraged every day by what we see and what we read. By slaughter and murder. Slaughter and murder and barbarism and insult and, and superstitious nonsense. We do not reply in kind. We don't say, we'll go and kill you if you go on insulting us like this. Do we get no credit for saying this? Uh, when, when has anyone ever said, what's it like to be insulted as someone who thinks that civilization is a real thing? Why is it always into faith? Why is it always into denominational? Why can't we say that all of these cults are equal and equivalent glimpses of the untrue? <laughs> How offended do I have to be to get these rights? No. To make a fuss? You should probably cloak it in, um, in faith. You know, there's a privilege for that. If someone said, I don't like what you just said, I'm going to kill you. I think the police might be on your side. If they said, I don't like what you said, I'm going to kill you because it was my faith, you can't count on the cops or the government anymore to do their job. And to the lady in the front, um, I do not say my belief system is no threat to anyone else's. I would hate to say that. I think my belief system is, a, is definitely a threat to those who, who believe in God and wish to impose theocracy. Now, if it wasn't, I would be ashamed of, to, to have it. But we can, if you want to make it gentle, we can. We have a great tradition in this country. It goes back, well, a long way. Uh, the, the classic statements of which are in uh, John Milton's Ariel Pogetica and in and John Mill's essay, John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, where it is said, that however discredited and, uh, an, an opinion may be, 
to ban it would still be a huge mistake because otherwise there would be no way of finding out if you yourself had made a correct point, if you had no opponent, if you'd silenced them. There would be nothing to argue with. There would be no measure uh, of your own articulacy or your own willingness to argue. Thus, it, it must always be the case that any opinion, no matter how unpopular, must be at the front and center of the argument. Rosa Luxemburg put it even better. She said, freedom of speech is meaningless unless it's for the person who thinks differently. Do you believe in the laws of libel, slander? No. I left England partly because of the laws of libel. Um, <laughs> it makes journalism almost impossible because, again, it's a matter of hurt feelings. A person who's bringing a lawsuit in Britain, many of them tried it on me when I was here, some of them have tried it since I've left, has only to prove that their reputation has been damaged or their feelings hurt. They don't have to prove that what I say is not true. Uh, th there you have it again. That's a secular form of the blasphemy law. So it's a matter really of etiquette. Uh, uh, I don't go around uh, in, in Washington where I live standing outside the synagogue and saying, you filthy Jew. Uh, I, I have a right to do it, but I don't. Let alone outside of Moscow or outside of a Catholic church. I, don't, I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. The question is, how much does this etiquette depend upon us? Uh, for example, um, there's a famous uh, six-letter word, actually, uh, that used to be used about African-Americans in, in the United States that nobody uses anymore. There's no law that says you can't. No serious person would use it, and no serious person would listen to it being said and not protest. That was done without legislation. There's no one... It's not illegal to do it. It's a cultural achievement, civilization achievement. What I'm being asked to do, though, sir, you understand my, my, uh, uh, the distinction I'm going to make, what I'm being asked to do in, I'll call it my own country just for now, my country of birth, my country of adoption, is legally to be told I may not criticize someone else's religious belief. That's quite different. Yeah, but I didn't... If you don't see that difference, and I think you do, but then I've been making my points very clumsily. But I hope I've made it more, in a more polished way this time. You no, you're trying to be too warm and furry. <laughs> you're hoping to wind up on a on a touching note of consensus and so on. <laughs> it's not it's not going to work. It's like you you say why why you, can't we unify rather than divide? Div politics is division. You use the word etiquette. Politics and philosophy are division by definition. You may as well get used to it. The dialectic is the only way you learn anything. No, you can't build a bridge in the middle of the river. It's silly to try. Um, it, I don't know why there should be an argument, or shouldn't be, in the English schools. Um, did the Middle Passage, the slave trade, rescue a huge number of Africans from the hell of remaining in Africa? You use the term Why etiquette. not? There, there are many people who've argued, argued at the time, have argued since. Uh, there are African Americans who say, I'm glad I didn't, my ancestors didn't stay in Senegal. People think, oh God, how can you possibly say that? After what the Middle Passage was like. Well, I can have just, have just, in fact, possibly said it. If you won't do that at thought experiment, you're not thinking seriously about how the argument went on. There can be no taboos, and especially there can be no taboos enforced by one community on another. You can't mention this because it upsets us, no. Teaching of history is impossible. Teaching of philosophy is impossible. Teaching of argument. Of, how to debate is impossible. How can you teach the Burt Payne debate or the debate between Wilberforce and Huxley about evolution without upsetting somebody? But I seem to remember in freedom of speech there's something about inciting violence. And I'm kind of curious as to why no one's mentioned George Galloway saying that Tony Blair should be the subject of suicide bombers. Is it just too absurd <laughs> or otherwise unworthy? There is a fighting words uh, exemption in, uh, in some American jurisprudence about the First Amendment, and that's actually what Oliver Wendell Holmes was talking about. There's a time when a word is a weapon when you're in fighting a fight and so forth. Um, on the whole, that's been struck down. There hasn't been a speech prosecution in America uh, since 1967-8, uh, and Mr. Galloway clearly did not call for the um, murder of the Prime Minister. Uh, because he hasn't got enough guts to do that. He says, uh, I would like it if it happened, but I'm not calling for it. In other words, if it does happen, don't look at me, but I did pre-approve it. 
Did he, he said he said it had, would have a moral justification yes. in his spectrum of yeah, moral yeah, He went, he said it would be a good thing, but he, would, like he did not seem, he recovered in time to say, well, I'm, of course I'm not recommending so. So if it happens, all we can say is that Galloway pre-approved it so that he's a, a coward, as I know him to be. A complete coward, moral coward, political coward, as well as a pimp for and a prostitute of Saddam Hussein and many other Turkeys. <laughs> There's, and Aaron Bevan used to say about the British press, there's no need for a censor because there's no need to muzzle sheep. Um, of George Galloway, you can say a person like that, who is a prostitute for fascism, convicts himself. But it was very interesting to see how unbrave he was as well as how demagogic. An absolutely perfect combination of uh, scumbaggery uh, combined and double, and double distilled. A religion is made out of man. It's the religious impulse itself that I think we need to oppose, to criticize, to criticize in ourselves as well as in others. The argument from faith, in other words, the argument from certainty. So those of us who maintain this may not be described, my closing point, as fundamentalists or secularists, as certain cheap and demagogic and opportunist forces have recently been suggesting we do believe in evidence, we do believe in skepticism, we do believe in reason, we hold our views, we hold our views with as much conviction and principle as any god botherer does. But we are open to the argument and we're going to prove it tonight to you. And don't let anyone dare to imply there's a moral equivalence between us and the fanatics and the fools and those who think they know God's will and can tell you what it is, who are our enemies, and your enemies too. I don't believe in the rest of it, don't believe in the prophets, don't believe in the mountaintop, don't believe in the revelation. Well, nor should you. But how dare you suggest to us that we couldn't teach our children self-restraint and respect for others in the golden rule? How dare you? Sorry, but I would, I would just remind you of what Carl Sagan uh, uh, said on this, um, which was he said that uh, there is no doubt that evolution has occurred. It's, it's in the molecular biological record, it's in the fossil record. There are disputes about how it occurred. The Darwinian theory is only the original one of how that might have, have taken place. And Darwin himself set out as an original taxonomist in order to prove the truth of Christianity. Uh, just as Sir Isaac Newton believed in alchemy and Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, believed in the phlogiston theory. Uh, we are always ready, all of us on this side, to be self-critical, to have a war within the war uh, among scientists, among uh, those who believe in innovation, evidence, hypotheses, and their testing. But that's entirely different from anything that is based on faith, on the supernatural, or on revelation, all of which belongs to the abject childhood of our species, before these things could even be discussed. There's no contest between the two magisteria, if you like. Can I but I do like the Parthenon very much. I've written a book about it. And I think, I think of, as, as an achievement of artistic symmetry um, and architectural glory, it probably has no Christian rival. But I believe that I can. In fact, I know I can. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has been there and said and appreciated and loved it without having to subscribe to the superstitions of the Eleusinian mysteries, to the cult of Athena and Zeus, to the Melian expedition and the Peloponnesian War, to slavery and Athenian imperialism, and to human sacrifice. We can have our Parthenon, and we can indeed recover it from what was done to it by Byzantine Ottomans, by Venetian Catholics, uh, by National Socialist barbarians and many others. We can still have it. It's our common property without the superstitions that go with it, without the dread and fear and sacrifice that the terrified, cringing humanity that was so much sheltered uh, under the walls as it was being raised. And the word for that, the ability to have these things, to have John Milton's poetry, uh, to have Philip Larkin's uh, poem Church Going, to have uh, Shakespeare, to, without the superstition, is called culture, on which we've all laid our lives, on which we've all sworn to defend ourselves and our civilization against, especially now, precisely against religious barbarism, against those who know they are right, against those who say they only need one book, against those who say they know God's on their side, against those who say there's a revelation. That's what culture is, that's what we're defending. Yes, we'd be better off with culture, and yes, we can have it without religion, which is a mind 
forged manacle. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Christopher, what's, what's wrong with that? If, if a belief in the afterlife helps one, as, as Brad said, deal with the inevitability of death, um, maybe this is a good thing. Um, that would mean that anything that made you feel good or better was fine, which I think is a contemptible position, I'm sorry to say. And it would, it would be as good as, as drugs, for example. And I don't believe, and in fact Marx never said, that religion is just an opiate. But religion and the afterlife fantasy have these things in common. First, they're man-made. That's very important. Uh, they, they represent claims by humans to be able to interpret the divine and to give themselves power by doing so. We all, we all admit we don't know. That's because we can't know. So the people who have to leave the island right away are those who say they do, who for centuries have tyrannized and still do millions of human beings by claiming to hold the keys of heaven and hell. Leading to my second point, religion is totalitarian in its practice and its theory. It claims to know things it can't know, and it claims to have powers it cannot have. It says if you make the right propitiations and the right donations, you may get paradise, and if you, if you don't, you may get an eternity of pain. That includes, by the way, the souls of unbaptized children of the millions uh, who Sam mentioned. Um, then, as I'm afraid to say, the, and also as you'd expect from the man, made the argument of fraud. Um, St. Peter's in Rome was built on the sale of indulgences, that's to say, in return for cash, the promise of a remission of sin and the time in hell or purgatory. I, it will happen to all of us that at some point you get tapped on the shoulder and told, not just that the party's over, but slightly worse, the party's going on but you have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's going on without you. That's, that's, the, that's the reflection I think that most upsets people about their demise. All right then, let's because it might make us feel better. Let's pretend the opposite. Instead, you'll get tapped on the, sho on the shoulder and told, great news, this party's going on forever, and you can't leave. <laughs> you, you've got to stay. The boss says so, and he also insists that you have a good time. <laughs> I've read about David's father, and I had a bad time when my own father passed on, but the father proposed by monotheism is the father who doesn't die, who reassures his children, don't worry, I'll never leave you. You'll never see the end of me. You'll never get the chance to feel sorry. I'm always there. I'm the absolute ultimate in dictatorship. And in my courts, there's no appeal. Do, do you really think that this would cheer up anyone of sentience or humanity or capable of feeling of irony? I submit it's out of the question. One of the reasons why I like doing this, some people say sometimes, don't I ever get tired of debating with the religious? No, absolutely I don't, because you never know what they're going to say next. <laughs> Sam and I don't mind being called predictable. It's very easy. We, we, we know what we think. We say straight out where we think we know, and where we think it's not possible to know, why we don't think there's a supernatural, and so on. But this evening already we've had your suggestion that God is only really a guru, a friend when you're in need. I mean, he wouldn't do anything like bugger around with Job to prove a point. And Which, if I now tell you, well, that must mean that that book is not the Word of God. You'd say, well, whoever believed that ever, that ever was the Word of God? <laughs> Let me just tell you something. For hundreds and thousands of years, this kind of discussion would have been, in most places, impossible to have. Or Sam and I would have been having it at the risk of our lives. Religion now comes to us in this smiley face, ingratiating way. <laughs> because it's had to give so much ground. And because we know so much more. But you've no right to forget the way it behaved when it was strong and when it really did believe that it had God on its side. <laughs> Saying that, think that, 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 that it's those of us who doubt the supernatural who have the failure of imagination. 
and good move. But, but there's no one who can't play this game. There could be an afterlife and no God. Why not? There could be many gods and no afterlife. There could be a God with a sense of humor where good people went to hell and, and evil people. <laughs> And evil, people and evil people carried on, as in his initial creation, ruling the roost. I would say it factionally increases my contempt for the false consolation element of religion and my dislike for the dictatorial and totalitarian part of it. But I presume what I say by the first is self-evident. But what I mean by the second is it's considered perfectly normal in this society to approach dying people who you don't know but who are unbelievers and say, now are you going to change your mind? It's, what, in fact, it's considered almost a polite question. <laughs> um, and it, as you know, there's a long history of fraud about this. People claim that Darwin had a deathbed recantation. They've made up lies about Thomas Paine. It goes on all the time. It's a very nasty little history, but it, it, there's also a horrible undertone of blackmail to it. People write and say, look, you've got, you've got about one chance left now. Aren't you going to take it? I'm writing to you as a friend. <laughs> as it, it, they've even tried on me when I've been very ill and not, I haven't had quite the vinegar I'd like to have had in, in, my, in a hospital bed. I don't mind, I can take it. But I think there are a lot of people older than myself, iller than myself, perhaps at the risk of seeming conceited, less educated than myself, to whom that's a horrible experience. It's, ve it, it's very depressing and alarming to be spoken to in that way. I mean, if Sam and I were to form a core of people to go around religious hospitals, which is what happens in reverse, and say to people who are lying in pain, say, did you say you were Catholic? Yes, well, look, you may only have a few days left, but you don't have to live them as a serf, you know. <laughs> Just recognize that that was all bullshit, that the priests, <laughs> the priests have been cheating you. And I guarantee you will feel better. I don't think that would be very ethical. Okay, but I think it would be something of a breach of taste. But, but if it's in the name of <laughs> if it's in the name of God, it has a social license. Well, fuck that, is what I say. <laughs> and and will say if it's my last breath. Thank you. <laughs> in other words, in these books. There are the warrants for genocide, for slavery, uh, for the torture of children, uh, for disobedience, uh, for genital mutilation, for annexation, for rape, and all the rest of it. But it's a very good thing that this is man-made. There are those who say that they wish they could believe, and I suppose a decent atheist could say that if only for lack of evidence he wishes he or she could. I can't be among their number. I'm very glad it is not true that there is a permanent, unshakable, unchallengeable celestial supervision. A divine North Korea in which no privacy, no liberty is possible from the moment of conception, not just till the moment of death, but until well after. I've been to North Korea and now I know what a prayerful state would look like. I know what it would be like to praise God from dawn till dusk. I've seen it happen. And it's the most disgusting and depressing and pointless and soulless thing you can picture. But at least with North Korea, you can die and you can leave. <laughs> but look through the Hubble telescope if you want to see something that is awe-inspiring. Don't look to blood-stained old myths. Now, why now? Why am I doing this now, people ask. Well, I'll tell you why now. Because in the last few years, it's become impossible to turn a page of a newspaper without being as the religious would say, offended. <laughs> in other words, I don't think I sound self-pitying if I say that I'm offended that a cartoonist in a tiny democratic country in Scandinavia, Denmark, can't do his job without a death threat, and that no American magazine or newspaper would reprint those cartoons, either to elucidate the question or in solidarity. I'm offended that civil society in Iraq is being destroyed, leveled by the parties of God. I'm offended the people in this country believe that they have the right to advocate the teaching of garbage to children under the fatuous name of intelligent design. I believe that we're... Uh, oh, I thought you'd never clap. Um, 
that just as I believe that where religion ends, philosophy begins, where alchemy ends, chemistry begins, where astrology ends, astronomy begins, and now when the people will say, well, let's give equal time to astrology in the schools, it's nonsense, dangerous and sinister nonsense. Uh, the Pope says, AIDS may be bad, but condoms are much worse. What kind of moral teaching is this? And how many people are going to die for such dogma? You see what I mean? So, I just, I'll, I'll be very brief. There's an end to this, an end particularly to the cultural cringe that says that if someone can claim to be a religious spokesman, they are entitled to respect. I have to say it in your presence, sir. I think that the title reverend is something people would, should be more concerned to live down than to live up to. Thank you. Of the number that have, were ever uh, in existence, more than 98.9% .9 have become extinct. A certain solipsism, I think, is required to believe that the, we, as a result of species, are somehow the center of the created cosmos. It would, it, this is not modesty, as the Christians call it. It's not uh, humility. It's an unbelievably arrogant claim to make. But at least it makes up for the other claim we're supposed to uh, put up with, which is, well, yes, but we're also miserable sinners conceived in filth and uh, doomed to uh, uh, abject ourselves. Both of these positions are too extreme too strenuous, too fanatical, uh, both of them reinforce each other in unpleasant ways, and both should be outgrown by us. We seem to be on, of one mind on this too. Uh, the, the, neither of us can prove or disprove the existence of God. The difference is between us. I don't say that I'm an ordained minister. I don't think I could push it that far. You say these texts are misused. I say that they are not. Um, the Old Testament says or does not say that Abraham was doing a noble thing by offering to sacrifice a son to prove himself loyal to God or to the voices he was hearing in his head. It says there was a noble thing for him to do. He was rewarded for it by a great, a great posterity and a great uh, long life. Offering to murder his son because of hearing voices in his head. This is not moral teaching to me. Is it not the case that the, that the Old Testament uh, says that the Amalekites must all be destroyed down to the last child, every one among them, not, leave not one? Yes, it does say that. The Bishop of Landaff, in an argument with Thomas Paine, once said, well, when it says keep the women, as Paine had pointed out, he said, I'm sure God didn't mean just to keep them for immoral purposes. But what does the Bishop of Landaff know about that? He says, kill all the men, kill all the children, and keep the virgins. I think I know what they had in mind. I don't think it's moral teaching. <laughs> to this day, there are nutbag settlers, uh, some Israeli citizens, some of them Americans, some of them Israeli Americans, trying to settle the West Bank in the name of this prophecy and throw other people off.